And that brings us to number eight. Under this baseline best practice, we suggest that you disable the 802.11b rates of 1, 2, 5, and a half, and 11. And this is a very, uh, almost a famous baseline best practice. So we'll talk about this. By looking under the band, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, we've just picked up two SSIDs. And we look here at the mode, and we see the mode is being referenced for the 2.4 gigahertz showing B, G, and N. And those were different vintages of 802.11 that came out over the years. 802.11B came out in 1999. Uh, 802.11G was released in 2003. 802.11N, which operates in both 5 gigahertz and 2.4, was released in 2009. So we go from very old to a little newer. But the key thing here to look at is the max rate, 144 megabits per second on both this SSID and this SSID, and then the basic rates. So basic rates are the lower rates. And lower rates are the ones that are, are deemed mandatory. And these are the rates that are used uh, for different types of important background traffic. For instance, all broadcast traffic, which includes beacons, uh, all management traffic, like probes, all requires, and this is built into the 811 standard, these all require that the access point transmit them at the lowest basic rate. So when you, by default, enable 2.4 gigahertz, for some reason, every single manufacturer will configure the basic rates 1, 2, 5, and a half, and 11 as the mandatory rates. 1 and 2 were the very, very first versions of 802.11. Very few things today require one and two megabit per second rates. Five and a half and 11 were technically the 802.11b rates. Those were the ones that were in use between 1997 and, uh, well, starting with 1999, I should say. So these rates right here are, I won't call them obsolete, but they're ancient. And there's very little equipment that actually requires the use of those rates. And yet every single vendor still enables them on by default. So the, the penalty that you pay by allowing this default setting to go on is that all of your management traffic and broadcast traffic that's transmitted on the network goes out at the lowest basic rate configured, in this case, one megabit per second. Okay, on a typical network, anywhere between 70 and 80% of your traffic is the simple background management traffic that goes on all the time. This is traffic that's important for the upkeep of the network, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't add anything to the user experience. It's really just there to keep the network up and running and visible for uh, connectivity. So if you're going to use this network at the very lowest basic rates, the penalty you're going to pay is that 80% of your traffic is going out at very, very slow speed, which has a direct effect on the network. The devices that are using the highest rate, 144 megabits per second, are the actual client devices when they're trying to transmit and receive data. But all this background traffic that accounts for the majority of the network transmissions is going out at a super slow rate. What can you do about it? You can go in and manually turn it off. And when you turn off one megabit per second as the lowest rate, now two megabits per second becomes your basic rate you've effectively doubled the speed of your background traffic just by doing that. But again, since nothing really requires that rate today, or very few things do, you'd be better off to clip it off and even five and a half 
And if you really feel that you need backwards compatibility with 802.11b, you'd be safe to clip off everything but 11 megabits per second. Now, why do you even need backwards support for 802.11b? 802.11b was in operation between 1999 and 2003, and then it was replaced by 802.11g. 802.11g would have the same rates as 802.11a, which are 6, 12, and 24. So technically, in most cases, you would be safe to clip off all those rates and quit allowing backwards connectivity for 802.11b and earlier. However, there are some cases where you need those rates. So I'm going to talk about those. Today, with the advent of uh, the Internet of Things and IoT, many devices which are small, um, uh, for instance, device-to-device -device communications, things like uh, thermostats, uh, clocks that are synchronized using Wi-Fi, different types of control systems that don't really have user uh, connectivity or intervention, but maybe control the uh, different systems within a building or uh, a venue of some type. Those devices may be using Wi-Fi to communicate, and because the devices are small, uh, very inexpensive, and many times run off a battery, it's possible that the manufacturer of that equipment has reached back into old inventories and purchased large, uh, uh, large lots of older types of radio chipsets. For instance, 802.11b chipsets. You can probably buy those for anywhere from 10 cents to 25 cents a piece if you buy them in large quantities. So you buy these radios really super cheap and disable some of the faster rates like five and a half and 11, you might get the batteries to last for you know a couple of years. So that's an excuse or a reason why you may still need to leave these rates on, but that's about the only one. Very, very few devices with the exception of old barcode scanners, which you may find in warehousing environments, really need to use anything prior to 802.11g. But I say and strongly recommend before you just clip these rates off completely, do some tests within your facility and make sure you don't have anything that requires those rates. And once you're confident, then, then turn them off because they're causing nothing but slowdowns in your network. Okay? So we would like to see all the rates, even on 2.4 gigahertz, with a minimum of 6, 12, and 24 set as the mandatory rates. On if you disable backwards compatibility for B and allow backwards compatibility for G, then the rates 6, 12, and 24 are what are, are turned on. But in today's environment, you can probably get away with turning off even more. And the key to this is by turning off these lower rates, which use a more robust modulation technique, you actually make the sizes, the areas of the cell, remember that NEG85 dBm co-channel interference threshold that we talked about earlier? You actually bring that in closer to make smaller microcells. And microcells require more access points to provide coverage, but the advantage is you get much higher performance by doing that. Okay? So I would suggest even turning off six megabits per second and leaving 12 megabits per second as your lowest rate. Some would say even turn off 12 and go to 24. 24 means that your cells are getting very small, and if you do that, you'll have extremely good performance as long as you have enough access points to provide overlapping coverage at a cell threshold of 24 megabits per second. So I. That might be a little much, depending on how much throughput, how much actual bandwidth you're using. If you're trying to cover big areas like a warehouse, 12 megabits per second is a good uh, basic rate. If you're trying to provide high speed data, for instance, in a hospital location, or uh, possibly a office location where you have huddle rooms, things like that, where you have a lot of video conferencing and things going on, 
then you can try going to the 24 megabits per second rate and I would try these out first okay but the rates are very very important there's something else to know here too when you see the max rate here when you look at your your computer and you look at the speed at which you're connected to the connection speed is not a good indicator of your performance so 144 megabits per second of a connection speed may or may not provide uh, a good idea of how fast your connection is the very best that we can hope to get when you look at what speed you're connected to your Wi-Fi network is 50 percent and to get 50 percent of that figure there in actual throughput all of these 10 baseline best practices have to be in effect and operating correctly. More on that coming up with our last best practice. Okay, so just to continue on, notice that we've got 144 megabits per second for both the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz SSID, but we're supporting rates of 1, 2, 5, and a half and 11, as opposed to 6, 12, and 24. When we look over here at the number of stations connected, on the five gigahertz, we've got eight stations connected. On the 2.4, we've only got two stations connected. And the, those two stations are taking up 48% of the channel availability just because of the inefficiencies of allowing one megabit per second to be turned on as a basic rate. Comparatively, the eight stations on the five gigahertz using six megabits are only accounting for 3% channel utilization, and that's why 5 gigahertz is more efficient than 2.4. You can make 2.4 better by clipping these rates, but you can never do anything about the amount of channel bandwidth available at 2.4. So in this case, we would say, again, failure. This baseline best practice says that 1, 2, 5, and half and 11 megabit per second rates are enabled on all 2.4 gigahertz radios and for no good reason. So when you configure your Wi-Fi, just turn it on, if you don't take additional steps, it's automatically going to configure 1, 2, 5, and half and 11 as the basic rates on 2.4 gigahertz, and that's not a good thing. So unless you need it, turn those off. And the only way you can tell if you're going to need them is to turn them off and see if something fails. So, I would say six megabits per second, it says, or higher. So I think a good number is 12 megabits per second for the lowest rate on both 2.4 and on 5 gigahertz, unless you have devices that you know require other rates.